Okay, uh, maybe we'll just get started, uh, just so we can uh, get out early and enjoy the nice sunny weather. Uh, my name is Esmond, I'm a pharmacist and I, I, I've helped a lot of people pass their CDE, I do this every year. Um, I wanted to thank Gord and Heather for sponsoring this event and I wanted to thank the Canadian Diabe the Calgary Diabetes Educator Chapter for sponsoring this event as well. Um, just for you guys to know, uh, I've got about 10 people online just uh, watching and joining us remotely. So if I'm talking to the computer, it's not that I'm crazy. I'm just talking to the people, uh, talking to people online. And for the people online, uh, if you have questions, just feel free to put it into the chat. I might not be able to answer it right away, but I'll try my best to, I'll for sure answer your questions by the end of the presentation. Yeah. Um, if you haven't signed in, if you could do so, that'd be great. There's uh, scrap paper everywhere. Please help yourself to the pizza and the salad and the drinks. And maybe we'll just start out with a little bit of an icebreaker. Why don't we go with uh, your name, your profession, and how, how, uh, which time of writing, how many times have you written the exam? So here, we'll start with you, Emmanuel. Hi, my name is Emmanuel. I'm medicine shop. Mission. Uh, this will be my first time reading the exam. <laughs> Good. It's, it's okay to be nervous. Uh, I'm Lisa. I'm the This is my first time right now. I'm a doctor. I'm a student. I'm a student. It's nerve wracking. I'm a dietitian. Okay. Yeah. Good. Oh, first time. Okay. 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 Marlene, average Okay, wonderful. So yeah, um, I want this just to be a very casual uh, presentation. If you have any questions or anything like that, just put up your hand or anything like that. Um, also, you guys are all writing it together, so you might as well kind of get to know one another, support one another, uh, and then hopefully uh, we'll see you at the after party. There's an after party as well after the exam. I mentioned that on my website, so hopefully we can see you all again and have a couple beers and forget about the exam afterwards. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to talk about medications today, but I'm also going to talk about CD studies because um, as you might have noticed, there's a lot of more, a lot more cardiovascular studies, and I'm guessing because there's so many more that they'll probably show up on the exam. That's that's my guess, but that's what I think will be on the exam. And so, uh, yeah, we've got a lot, a lot of slides to go through, but again, just chat at any time, right? Okay, so. Here. Perfect. Okay, so I just want to just to recap. Uh, we discussed why insulin was important, and it's because you need the you need insulin to get glucose from the blood into your cells. Without that, your cells slowly starve and die, and that's why Teddy Ryder here he was he was in the age before insulin was invented. This this was him before insulin therapy, and this is him afterwards. Uh, we also talked about. Uh, the guidelines and the treatment algorithm. So this is something you should have memorized for the exam. I'm sure it's gonna show up. And we're going to be talking about why this, in this area here, why some areas are considered if you have uh, for CV that benefit. Okay. So we stopped at SGLT2 inhibitors last presentation. I'm just gonna quickly go through the medications. Most of you are pharmacists here, but I'll just quickly, I'll quickly go through the medications and then we'll talk about, start going to the cardiovascular studies that you'll need to go through the exam. All right? So, A-carbose or glucobay. How many people have, have you guys dispensed this lately? Like for the pharmacists, no? Anyone dispense it in the last? Five years ago. Oh, 21. Anyone dispense this in the last year? Okay, so some people are still, still using it. So what it does, it inhibits the pancreatic enzymes in your, the, the alpha glucosidase in particular, in your intestines, and that stops carbs from breaking down. Now, given that you know that, what do you think will be its hypoglycemia risk? Let's shout it out. Low, and why? 
Why is the hypoglycemia very slow? Sorry, huh? Yeah, why is the hypoglycemia very slow? Good, because you're not affecting insulin. Okay. Yeah, uh, so that's why it has negligible risk of hypoglycemia as a model therapy. Uh, same thing with the weight gain, because it's not affecting the pancreas, it's not uh, secreting insulin, it also doesn't cause very much, it has negligible weight gain as well. Yeah. Some other considerations are that GI side effects are really common. That's probably why you don't see it very much. Uh, People have lots, tend to have lots and lots of gas on this medication. That's why you just split it up into three times daily. And that's why if you do have, start someone on a carbose, it's really important, important to start at a very low dose and then slowly increase. And then, like, I know it's not a very common medication, but it does, I feel it does still have a place. For lots of my geriatric patients who have like low renal function or who are very sensitive to lows, uh, this, this medication, given low dose, their A1C is not that high, like 7.2, and we want to just slowly get them in, slowly get them to target. This is a, still a good medication for that. Hmm. Okay, so here's... Yeah, acarbos is pretty cheap. It's definitely covered in... Yeah, so... So it's, it's definitely covered by Seniors Blue Cross. So uh, that means they would pay a max of $25 for every 100 day supply. So um, actually, I don't know if it's probably even cheaper than the $25, I'm guessing. Yeah, so it's, it's very inexpensive. So that has, that's a bit of a pro for it. Okay, so this question seems to, <laughs> uh, uh, we'll we'll go, go for it slowly. <laughs> uh, so this question seems to show up on every exam. I'll just give you a minute just to take a look at that. And just for you people at home. Okay. Okay. So here's the answer and we'll go through why each one's not right. Okay. So this is a question, this is a not question. So remember, <laughs> yeah, there's gonna be lots of not questions on the exam. So what is, what is glucose? Glucose inhibits alpha glucosidase, right? So you can't treat it with uh, cane, sh cane sugar. You can't, tr you can't treat it with things that need to be broken apart because the, the acarbose is inhibiting that. So you can't treat it with sucrose because sucrose requires, requires uh, it to be broken apart. So you're, you're not treating it properly. You can use dextrose, you can use milk, you can use fructose, but you can't use sucrose for, the, for, the, for treating those if they're only carbos. Okay, any questions at home? Nope, doesn't look like it, oops, whoa. Sorry. Okay, so let's talk about sulfonylureas. So sulfonylureas are an old class of medications. They've been around for a long time, and they activate the receptor on the beta cell to force it to make more insulin. Um, as you've already mentioned, uh, because it does, uh, does uh, stimulate insulin secretion, it is at a higher risk of causing loads. Glyburide is the higher. Glyburide has a higher risk, and there's less with glycoside and repagonide. There is weight gain because anytime you're stimulating insulin, there's, there's weight gain. Um, yeah, with the meglinotides, that's stuff like gluconorm, it's a little bit less. And there's also a possible risk of increasing CV risk and mortality of glyburide. So that's why if you see someone glyburide, try to get the family physicians, physician to switch them to glucoside or maybe something else altogether. Okay. Another sample question. This one's a bit longer. Give you guys a minute to look at that. Oh, I didn't even realize there was a shop right here. So if you have any questions, I'll write it down in here and I'll answer them by the end of the presentation. OK. 
Okay. So the correct answer is glucanone. So let's take a look at why that's the correct answer. So uh, bidumin is a good, good choice. It's a GLP analog. Uh, wouldn't cause, doesn't, wouldn't cause, look, less chance of causing lows, less chance of causing waking. Why is that one not the right answer? Uh, Bidurion is, is a GLP, GLP analog. Sorry, what was that? Thyroid yes, thyroid cancer, that's right. All the GLP analogs are contraindicated if there's thyroid cancer. So this guy has, yeah, family history of thyroid cancer. So that's why A is wrong. Why is B wrong? Yes, it causes lows, but so does that. <laughs> yeah, so. The erratic meals, that's what I'm looking for. So yes, the lows and the erratic meals. So he's a truck driver and you know, we've got lots of patients like this. I've got lots of patients who go to Fort McMurray, they tell me they drive like these humongous uh, 10 ton trailers. And they're the last person I want to have a low because if they crash it, that's like really, really, really bad news. Um, as I was saying earlier, I want to go through my career without using my malpractice insurance. So, so this is something to look out for. So that's why B is wrong. That's why C is wrong. Uh, and, that's, and that's why e, e is wrong as, as well. Uh, so with D, with gluconorm, you can actually dose it uh, according to meals. So if he skips a meal, then he just skips the gluconorm. If he has, uh, if he has dinner at like midnight, then you can just take it at midnight. And that is, has a less chance of causing lows. Uh, the mass of gluconone is 16 milligrams. Yeah, so you can take four milligrams four times a day if necessary. I've never had, I've never used such a high dose. Uh, the max I've used is gluconone four milligrams three times a day. But yeah, some people like to have like a bedtime snack, I guess, and if it did cause it to really go up. You could maybe give a small dose. The beauty of gluconorm is that, you know, most people I start on one or two mil, depending on the situation, I start them on one or two milligrams. And I tell, okay, if you're having your granddaughter's birthday and you're having cake and pizza and stuff like that, then just, you can take more. Uh, or if you're having a really light meal, you're having like a salad, just a few croutons, you can actually just skip the gluconorm or just take half the dose. So it gives them a little bit, that's why I like glucanorm. It gives them a bit of flexibility that way. But then you do have to educate them about uh, carbohydrate counting and things like that because they might not understand that, oh, I had a humongous salad, but that has no carbs. So that way, yeah. you know, or uh, I had, I don't know, a really fatty meal with no carbs. I don't know what that would be, but yeah. So when you're yeah. prescribing it, then would you make sure that they have to understand the carb counting? For this, or I mean, in order, like a lot of people don't even understand what a carb is. Mm -hmm. So you do all that teaching, and then you prescribe it, or do you say, okay, let's start with one milligram pre meals mm -hmm. and food log for me, or how do you sure. do that? Um, if it's okay, I'm just going to repeat the question for the people at home. So the question is, uh, for when I'm prescribing it, do I talk about carbohydrate counting right away before prescribing it? And so it's depending on the patient, but generally no. Usually I would start them on a low dose first. And then, if they're, if, and then once they're more comfortable with the idea of carbohydrate counting and knowing what's a high carb meal and low carb meal, then I'll kind of introduce that kind of more, a little bit more advanced thing. Uh, when I'm prescribing it, my first part is to make sure that they know how to use it right and make sure that they don't have a low. Because I find if you prescribe something and then a the patient has a low on it, they're much, much less, less, less likely to trust you from here on in. So that kind of trust is, I want to preserve that as much as possible. And so usually I try to just be really simple at first. So you just start at one milligram? Yeah, one or half a mil, or four or five milligram, yeah. Depending on how hard. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's really useful for okay. Hey, you're always high at lunch, so or or you're always high after supper. So then they'll be like, okay, let's do two milligrams at supper and one milligrams for the rest of the rest of the time. Or hey, you have a you, in your food diary for your breakfast. You just have 
a fruit smoothie with not with like a berry smoothie or something like that, and you go low after you go low before lunch. So let's go 0.5 for breakfast, one for lunch, and two for supper or something like that. You can absolutely individualize it that way. That's why I kind of like this drug because you can you have a lot of flexibility. You also don't have to start TID as well. If you if they're like almost a target, but it's just one meal a day where they're high, then you can just start that glucanorm one to two milligrams at that one meal. You know, why inconvenience the patient if you don't have to? Yeah. Oh, and I got a question from the audience. The question is, oh, you're adding heels. Yeah, that's it. That's right. Good. Yeah, any other questions about that? Glucanorm is also really useful because you can use it in very low renal function patients. Uh, generally, people who have really, really low renal function, your two options are insulin and, and glucanorm. Kind of Tridenta, depending on, on the situation. But uh, yeah, like those are, those are a case by case basis, but glucanone is also useful for that because it's mostly metabolized for the liver and not for the kidney. And lots of, I'm assuming lots, you see that lots of your patients have uh, low renal function. Oh. Okay, so next we'll, this is actually really hot setting here. Uh, <laughs> okay. So next we have TZDs. So here, let me just position just so that I can see, but I'm not standing right in the sun. Okay, uh, TZDs. So D, what these do is, is that they go into each your genes and they actually increase uh, patient's insulin sensitivity actually. So what do you think the risk of hypoglycemia is? So shout it out. <laughs> Okay. So it's actually not too bad because it's quite slow acting. And um, yeah, so the hypoglycemia risk is not bad. It does cause some weight gain though uh, because it can cause uh, edema. It's also for cardiovascular outcomes, it's neutral. That's in contrast to a Vandia, which may or may not have some some adverse cardiovascular outcomes. So Avandi is why all these, all these uh, drug companies are doing CV studies now. And that's why you have to memorize all the CV studies. It's because of Avandi, Avandi was thought to cause these, thought to actually increase heart attacks and things like that. So then the FDA said that, okay, from now on, whenever, whenever any uh, diabetes drug comes out, you have to make sure it's cardiovascular safe. And so all these companies started doing that, and now that's why you have to memorize it for the exam. So you can blame it all on Avandia. Do you think that because these are kind of old fashioned, there's going to be a lot of questions about the Um, I could, I could. So for the exam, they actually, I find that they actually test a lot of, have a lot of questions on older medications actually. Um, like they'll. A lot of questions will say, oh, they're on human N or human R. And like, I, I rarely use human N. And has, has anyone dispensed human R lately in the last year? Oh, they have used human R? Oh, good. Oh, okay. Interesting. So maybe that's how they keep in business. But um, yeah, on the exam, I think you'll find a lot of questions on older medications and older insulins, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. And here's some other considerations. Uh, because of the edema, they're contraindicated if they have severe heart failure because you don't want to add additional fluid into the system. Into the system. They're already overloaded. Uh, there's this weird fracture thing with pioglitazone. And watch out for bladder cancer uh, with uh, pio pioglitazone. And then there's just a the controversy with rosiglitazone, which is a vania. Okay, on to DPP4s. So, uh, what, so what, as you're eating right now, your stomach is creating these hormones called incretins. And D DPP4 is an enzyme in your body that comes and chomps up those incretins. Those incretins are beneficial though. They travel to your pancreas, they help it secrete more insulin, they suppress glucagon, which is good because glucagon is a counter-regulatory hormone. 
So you want less of that. And it also travels to your brain to tell you that you're full. So you actually want more incretins with people with diabetes. But this DPP-4 enzyme actually comes in and chunks it all up. So what these medications do is they stop that enzyme and they boost up your GLP levels a, a little bit. Not as much as GLP-1s, but a little bit. Yeah. Uh, because they don't affect insulin, there's very low risk of hypoglycemia. They're neutral for weight. CV outcomes are neutral, and I'll talk about that in more in just a sec. Uh, DPP-4s are generally quite well tolerated. I haven't had anyone complain about stomach upset or anything like that with uh, DPP-4. Does anyone else have like intolerable, have a case where the patient just could not tolerate their DPP-4? No? Okay, yeah. So they're pretty, pretty well tolerated. No one here has had any, any issues. Okay, GLP analogs are kind of like a stronger version of DPP-4s. They're injections. Uh, they're incretins, but they're actually incretins, so it's something that help, helps it to uh, not be broke, broken down. So they're way more potent than DPP-4s. Uh, they have very low risk of hypoglycemia. They actually help with weight loss. Uh, so some of them do have, are found to be cardioprotective, and we'll talk about which ones in just a second. Um, some other considerations are that because they're more stronger than DPP-4s, they tend to have more side effects. Um, I've had a lot of patients who can't tolerate Victoza or Ozempic or Bayetta or whatever. Um, how about you guys? Have you had that experience? Yeah. Say what? I couldn't. You couldn't tolerate it yourself. Okay. <laughs> Non-stop diarrhea or vomiting or throwing up. Okay. Okay. Subsiding. That's that sounds about right. Um, but I've had patients. Yeah, I've had patients who are like just constant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can do that trick. Yeah. Yeah, so that's a trick you can do with a lot of GLPs. Like on the pen, it's like 0 0.6, 1.2, 1 1.8, but you can do clicks in between. Like there's 10 clicks in between each one. So uh, for some really sensitive patients, I've gone up by like five clicks, and then you can just do it that way. Yeah, but then you have to count the clicks because they're not, you don't actually see the, um, see the number. So they have to like count the clicks. Yeah. Jesus, the sun is like chasing me around the room. Yeah, maybe I'm going to switch over, sorry. Okay. There, I can hide in like the shade there. All right. Um, yeah, any other questions with GLP? And any questions from the audience? No? Okay, perfect. So in summary, uh, insulin is a key, to a key in the pathophysiology of insulin. Uh, several, medica several medications utilize insulin and some don't. And if you can understand how insulin works, it can lessen how much you have to memorize. If you just understand that you know medications that stimulate insulin generally have weight gain and hypoglycemia, medications that don't generally have weight may have weight loss and cause less hypoglycemia. Okay, so this is some, this is a, actually I grabbed these slides from, from, from Gordon, Gord here. Uh, this is a slide deck developed by Dr. Sudha Varma and Dr. Lawrence Leder. Uh, there's various uh, people involved in this presentation and this presentation will look at CV outcomes uh, we'll go review some statistics that will be on the exam because there's always some statistics on the exam, unfortunately. And uh, we'll apply the evidence to management of diabetes. So let's go to our first statistics question. Statistical data. Well, I kill off the shade here. So what do you guys think the answer is? 
Yeah. Oh, sorry. That's die. <laughs> Most likely die from. Sorry. Yeah. So the answer is heart disease. So the majority of people uh, of your patients will likely die from heart disease. The statistic is 65 to 80 percent. Uh, so that's way more than any other uh, outcome. Like kidney disease is common with diabetes, but people are more likely to die from, heart, from a, a cardiac issue, like a stroke or a heart attack. Uh, amputations are bad, but they're, they, and they cause a lot of morbidity and mortality, but it's way less common than heart disease. And comparatively speaking, DK is actually quite rare compared to all these other things. So definitely that's not the most common cause of death. Okay, so if you have diabetes, so in the, like we have the brain, we have risk and all that kind of stuff. But another thing that we're starting to talk about is cardiovascular age, in that you know smoking causes you to have an increase in cardiovascular age, or having uncontrolled hypertension causes you to have an increase in cardiovascular age. So it's like you've got a 40-year-old body, but if you're like a smoker, you've got like a 60-year-old heart, and the 60-year-old heart is more prone to heart attacks and strokes and things like that. So how much does how much years of cardiovascular age does diabetes confer? Yeah, that's good. That is a good guess. And as the right answer. Oh, I got a question from, from the audience at home. Where's my mouse? Okay. Oh, okay. Uh, Bob, and you don't have to answer the, answer the question. You can, uh, I'm just looking for questions. Okay, so uh, here's the gradient of increased risk. So you can see that people uh, with diabetes, regardless of, of age, have a big uh, increase in uh, all-cause mortality, as well as from CVD. So this black line is without diabetes, and with this, this orange line is with diabetes. And it's significant, like the, P, the P value is a statistical value. Anytime it's above 0 0.05, below 0 0.05, it's statistically significant. So having a P value of 0 0.01 is humongous. That means it significantly, significantly increases all-cause mortality. Yeah. Um, and we know this because diabetes increases vascular inflammation in, in, the, in the body. The, the higher your sugars are, the more your body turns cholesterol and things into, into plaques, and the more inflammation, inflammation there is. Hold on, just give me one second. Okay, oops. Okay. Uh, yeah, so that's why we use cardiovascular protective medications sooner with people with diabetes. If we know that they're going to have more heart attacks and more heart attacks earlier than the general population, that's why we put them on preventive medications sooner. So yeah, this just reviews that uh, diabetes causes an increase in MACE, which is major, major adverse cardiovascular events. Heart failure events, CV death causes to oxidative stress because it increases free radical production, inflammation, inflammation uh, causes cytokines, which are uh, harmful to the veins. There's links between insulin resistance, insulin resistance and dyslipidemia, hypertension, increased clotting, and obes obesity, obesity, of course, contributes to insulin resistance. Okay, so here is a common test question. And then we'll talk about how to figure, talk about which part of the guidelines it's in. Okay, so what do you guys think it is? Just shout it out. Okay, just be adventurous. You're going all right to exam together. You might as well get comfortable with one another. Okay, so the answer is actually C. And here's why. So if you take a look at this case, yep, oh, sorry, here you go. 
this will be all posted on YouTube. Am I recording? Oh, good, I am. Okay, last time I forgot to record. Okay, uh, this will all be posted on YouTube so you can see it. So let's let's talk about why. So the first part is if they have had a cardiovascular event, they're on aspirin, they're on ACE inhibitor or ARB, and they're on a statin. Okay. So looking back, Sam, he does ha he has no cardiovascular events, no microvascular events. So he doesn't so he doesn't need aspirin. Um, and then does he have microvascular disease? So the answer is no as well. He has no retinopathy, he has no neuropathy, he has no nephropathy, so he doesn't have any microvascular disease. So the part, so the, the depression part in recreational drugs is just to throw you off. Uh, so he, looking at here, he is above 30 and he's had diabetes since he was nine years old. So he's had diabetes for 30 years. So that's why here he's age 30 and he's had that, he's actually had diabetes for like twice that amount. So that's why you could consider him for a statin. Does that make sense? I know it sounds constant kind of odd because like I'm I'm pretty close to turning 39 and it's like I don't want to be on this statin. But because if I had had diabetes, particularly for both diabetes for 30 years, my cardiovascular age is probably a lot higher than, than 39. Yeah. Does that help you? Well, I wasn't quite but there's an R that you added though. I mean he doesn't have C like he doesn't have any. Not vascular issue at this point, but mm -hmm. like, are we trying to prevent that from happening? Isn't that the point of the clinical trials? It is. Um, you know, blood pressure control. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think he would just be too young to get benefit. I, if this was my, if Sam was my patient. And he, this guy, this is based on a real patient. Um, I kind of wouldn't want to tank his blood pressure, lower his blood pressure anymore. And also, like, he's 39. He doesn't, I, like, in real life, he already doesn't like being on insulin. I don't, trying to get him on a staff, and I think was, was kind of difficult to convince him. So, like, you have, you absolutely have a point. Like, you know, with ACEs and ARBs, we're trying to re reduce our renal risk. But, um, but I don't know what dosage is specific to the dosage to actually help with the patient, like maybe the lowest as possible. Or I think it's different for each ACE and ARB. Um, I think it's like at least a medium dose for most of the. Or around 12 to 25 or something. I don't so think that. I don't think that. I don't think studies would would I back that up. But actually, I think that one of the things that we get. Just wouldn't get value at this point in the game. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Okay, so this is something you definitely have to memorize for the exam because there's probably at least one or two questions on this. So let's look at some more statistics. What do you know about heart failure? And so the incidence of heart failure is about two to four higher in people with diabetes compared to those without diabetes. So that's significant as well. If you have you know, if I had a 10% chance of getting heart failure with diabetes, it'd be more like, you know, two to four is like 20 to 40%, basically. So uh, people with diabetes are a much higher risk of heart failure. Uh, here's the risk of cardiovascular disease in general among people treated with type two diabetes. So heart failure is higher than stroke and myocardial infarction. Here's some statistics on who gets heart failure. So surprisingly, women actually have uh, quite a high risk of heart failure. Yeah. Okay, so here's another question. Uh, 
And then we're going to get into cardiovascular studies. Because this has actually, this, okay, yeah, I remember why I created this question. So this happened, this, oh, actually there's two questions in here. Okay, so what do you guys think is the answer? Just shout it out. C. Okay, good. So that's correct, the answer is C. Uh, so if you look at metformin, actually, if you look at the monograph, it actually says to be used uh, in caution with people with heart failure. And so uh, when I was a student, I was like, I was like, oh my God, like, you know, you can't use metformin in people with heart failure. But metformin is used in heart failure all the time. Uh, in the guidelines, there's actually a specific part in it where it says, you know, despite what the monograph says, just ignore it, it is okay to use in heart failure. The reason why they thought metformin was a problem was because, you know, heart failure causes hypoxia. And metformin was thought to cause hypoxia as well. And that leads to lactic acidosis. But really, with metformin, it was the precursor, benformin, that caused more lactic acidosis. Metformin actually has a very rare chance of causing lactic acidosis. So that's why in the guidelines, it's like it's okay to use metformin. But if you were just reading the monograph, you'd be like, oh, this is dangerous. But it's not. Metformin is, is okay. Uh, Dimicron's okay in heart failure or not. Actos isn't because it increases fluid retention, causes edema, and that worsens heart failure. And for it actually improves uh, patient outcomes with uh, heart failure. So that's when you actually want them to have it on. Okay. I have to maybe speed this up quite a bit. Uh, diabetes is the third most important predictor for adverse heart failure. So it's eat, after age and sex, it's diabetes. Diabetes also causes a lot of renal disease. Uh, people with diabetes are six to 12 times li more likely to be hospitalized for chronic kidney disease or end-stage renal disease. And yeah, if you have diabetes and chronic kidney disease, it's about a 40% increase in 10-year mortality. So very, very big statistics uh, that are not good if you have poorly controlled diabetes. And that's because diabetes affects a lot of things. It affects the pump, which is the heart, it affects the filter, which is the kidney, and it also affects the plumbing, which is the, all the arteries as well. Diabetes negative, negatively affects all three of those things, leading to heart failure, renal disease, and uh, major adverse cardiovascular events. Here we go. That's the question I want to And we'll just speed this up. So when you've got your answer to show your answer. So what's your answer? The shadow. Oh, okay. All friends here. I see. Huh? And by what age should it be considered to go into the stroke? Should she recover those? Let's say she, it was a bad stroke, but she recovered. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Did I not make it? Okay. Okay, so this is a bit of a trick question. So the answer is D because they're type yeah. one. And so, yeah, so you've got to watch out for that on the, on the test. Uh, in Canada, in Canada, uh, SGLT21s are contraindicated with type one diabetes. Uh, there's some in, in Europe, actually, where Ziva just got it okay to be used in type one diabetes. And in real life practice, there's a couple endocrinologists I know that actually use SGLT2s. That's why I said so. Okay, <laughs> but on the exam, it's based on and it's guidelines. Tricky because C it has cardiovascular benefits. Yeah, so yeah. Why that, didn't you pick one that doesn't have? Uh, 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 yeah, so yeah, that's, that's a bit of a trick question, but you gotta watch out for those on the exam. Expect those on the exam. So make sure if it's, it says type one or type two, make sure you're, you're thinking about the right one. They will okay. always stick with what's on the product. Mm -hmm. Okay, so off label stuff. Yeah. Yeah, you like just because, like, yeah, like, you know, some endocrinologists do use uh, GLTs and SGLT2s in type 1s, but don't expect that on the exam. It's strictly by the product model. Okay. Oops.
Yeah, so canical, this would be the answer if that was type two diabetes. Yeah, so you just, but just watch out for that. Okay, so we're running out, we're running out of time. Uh, DPP4, so here's the line of significance. So if it, if it crosses this line, that means the, the effect was not statistically significant. So you can look for all the DPP4s, and none of them, all of them crossed the line of significance, so none of them were, uh, none of them were beneficial for cardiovascular outcomes. So if the line, ex well, so the line ex extends through here, that means that it was statistically insignificant. If it was like over here, that means it actually would do harm. Like the putting a DPP4 would actually increase their CD risk. And then down here, it would actually decrease their CD risk. So as you can see, for all the SGLT2 inhibitors, uh, Faxagliptin is on Glyza. Alagliptin is Mazina. Does anyone, has anyone seen that here? I think it's only marketed in Quebec or something like that. Okay. Anyway, so you, you won't see it here. Uh, Ticos is uh, Ticos is a study, Sinagliptin is Genuvia, and Linagliptin is Trigenta. So all of them uh, didn't improve CV disease, but none of them and but none of them increased it either. Do you actually memorize all the trials? You don't have to memorize the trials, but you do need to know that none of the DPP4s are cardioprotective. Sure. Yeah. Uh, so GLPs are different because some of them were cardioprotective. So you do need to know which ones were. Um, and so some of them did show significant benefits. Uh, lix lixinitide is adalixine, which comes, so there's a lot of combo products and you, you might have to know them. So, adal so lixinitide is adalixine which comes in combination with glargine for soliqua. So there's a com okay, let's go over to Yeah, so it comes in combination with an insulin and it combines with soliqua by itself as adalexine. Adal uh, Liraglutide is Victoza, uh, and they had the LIDA trial, which showed that it was statistically significant, that it did decrease, uh, had cardioprotective effects. Uh, the Victoza, uh, Liraglutide is Victoza at a low dose, but if you just, they also market it as a high dose for weight loss, and that's Xenda. Um, also, it comes in combination with Degladec to make Zoltofi. <laughs> Zoltofi, uh, X U L T O P H Y. That's in combination with uh, Degladec. Uh, Semaglutide is once weekly Ozempic. Um, it's so that one showed significance as well, but the study, you, the study wasn't powered to show actual superiority. It was just powered to show that it was the same as Victoza. Um, Exenatide is, as a once daily, is Bayetta, and they put in an SR formulation to make Bidurion, which is once weekly. Unfortunately, it was just barely out of significance. It was 0 0.06. So it just touches this line, so you don't know if it's statistically significant or not. You know, these with but in general, like with statistics, the further this way it is, the better it is, the better it is. Uh, but te technically it did not reach statistical significance. And then this is abaglutide, which is tanzium, but I don't has anyone seen that? Tans the abaglutide? I don't think that's available in Canada, so don't, don't worry about that one. Okay, so we're gonna go for the SGLT2 inhibitors, uh, inhibitor trials in detail. That's Emperreg for Jardians, Canvas for Invocana, and Declare for Brazil. How many times will they, will they, if they talk about a net, will they take both names generally? Yep, they did. They just that just changed recently, actually. When I wrote it the first time, they just gave the generic name. But lately, and I, I'm assuming that they'll continue on with this, they give the brand name in uh, we'll give the bra brand name and then in brackets they'll give the chemical name. Uh, yeah, like this, exactly how I'm doing it. So yeah. I'm assuming they'll continue, but I, I don't know, don't know if they will or not. <laughs> yeah, let, let me know after the exam. We're having beers. Okay, so let's look at Emperag. That was the first one that was on uh, Jardians. So something to note was that it was 100% secondary prevention, meaning that these, all the patients in this trial 
already had had some sort of established cardiovascular disease, like stroke or heart failure or something like that. And again, you look at the p-values. So you look at, you're looking for a p-value less than 0 0.05, which means it's statistically significant. And you can see that was positive for MACE, major adverse cardio, cardiovascular events. HHF is hospital, hospitalizations for heart failure. That was significant as well. CV death, it was significant. And renal outcomes, it was significant as well. Yeah. Um, yes. These are the lines. You can see that it separates very quickly. Um, I don't know how I'll have time today, but if I don't have time, I'll talk about the, I'll post my video on the UK PBS and the DCCT. Both of those trials, it took like 20 years for uh, the, these kind of cardiovascular curves to branch out. But if you look at the SGLT2 for, for, this, uh, for Guardians, it starts branching out right away. So that was really, really big news because for a long time, we didn't know, we didn't know if, we didn't know exactly how much benefit uh, reducing A1C had on uh, cardiovascular benefits. Like we knew a lot about microvascular, but we we're more sure about macrovascular. Okay, so this is MACE, and then that's hospitalizations for heart failure. As you can see, the curve separates right, right, right pretty quickly, and there's lots of uh, the p-value is nice and low, meaning that it's statistically significant. That's okay. This is Canvas, which is for Invocana. So no, so Invoc the Canvas trial had a one third primary prevention people. So those are the people without previous heart attacks, strokes, heart failure, and Generally, people with generally people in primary prevention are healthier than people in secondary prevention because they haven't had a stroke before. And so this this had different results. It still showed superiority for MACE, but it didn't show superiority for hospital, hospital hospitalizations for heart failure, CV death, and renal outcomes. Uh, in the curve here. It, the curve doesn't really show it that well, but this was statistically significant and that, that wasn't. And that's a one-third primary prevention and two-thirds secondary prevention. Uh, and then we will talk about DECLARE. And so DECLARE was 60% primary prevention. So that, they had like kind of like the healthiest patients because again, generally primary prevention patients are healthier than secondary prevention. And these were its outcomes. Uh, it did reach significance for CV death and hospitalizations for heart failure. Actually, uh, it was quite, quite significant. Like anything below 0 0.05 is significant. And it got 0 0.005. Yeah. Was that how we would think which one to look at? Like if, it's, if they've never had any history of cardiovascular like events in the past. Mm -hmm. Then would you go with the declare study that for SIPA versus SIPA, knowing that the result for the primary was mostly different? Mm -hmm. So, uh, in, in, in a nutshell, yes. Uh, it is important, it's, I feel it's important to prescribe based on evidence. And so, if you're looking at someone who has just pure primary prevention, they've never had a heart attack before. All that evidence for amperic was on secondary prevention. So uh, yeah, like if the if if you have if you have a patient for secondary prevention, if they or if they have had a stroke or heart attack, there's the guidelines do say go go with particular yeah go with uh, an SGLT2 or GLP that's cardioprotective. But in primary prevention, it's more it's more open. There's no particular guideline about it. But if you were to for me, if I would prescribe according to evidence, I would look for something with more primary prevention. Yeah. Okay, here are those curves again. Uh, there wasn't superiority for MACE, but there was superiority for CV death. Again, this was 60% uh, primary prevention. Uh, here is again, is just a review of which studies affected which ones. So MPREG was completely uh, secondary prevention, Canvas had a third and two thirds, and then Declare was docs at two thirds primary, about two thirds primary, and a third secondary. Yeah. So, what would an example to 
the video will be in the tab because it will be questions on this like on the right. Um so I don't think there'll be a question like directly on like the patient populations of the studies, but I think it'd be more like okay, if you have a patient with if you were if you had a patient who already has established cardiovascular disease, which medication would you would you choose? Yeah. I don't think there'll be a question directly on the thing. They might say the, the thing is, these things are new, so I think there will be a lot of questions on it. But I don't think they'll directly ask you, like, what was, how many patients were enrolled in Declare, and how, what was the number of type, how many, like, you could get really deep into this. You can look into, like, the male female split, like, you know, blood pressure split. Yeah, sexual differences. Um, yeah. Do you think the question says primary care? So Empereg was secondary and yes. Uh, Empereg was completely secondary. Okay. Uh, Canvas was one about one third primary and two thirds secondary. Oops. And then Declare was about two thirds primary and one third secondary. Yeah, yeah, oh, absolutely good. So Declare percentage is that it's the largest trial, 17,000. That group that was in the secondary prevention declared was as big as all of them were. Okay, and then they had 10,000 plus that were primary. So it's, it's the biggest trial. Hmm. Any other questions or concerns about that? Okay. So what is so here if you can figure this out, you will be the most famous endocrinologist or diabetes educator in the world. So right now we don't so we have SGLT2s and we've improved cardiac, cardiac outcomes and we've improved renal outcomes. But no one really knows exactly why yet. And if yeah, so if you can figure this out, you will become the most famous, famous diabetes person in the world right now. They have a lot of uh ideas thinking that might just improve fluid balance or reduce edema or reduce stress on the on the heart and the kidneys but no one really knows why currently this is something to memorize for the exam uh, so if they do have established cardiovascular disease then you'd be going for chemical and empirical or liragatide yeah. Okay. And do yeah. you think do you think this megatype can be done with them or some other type? See, I don't yeah. so the deadline okay, so the deadline for being on the exam is twenty February tw February first, twenty nineteen. That's the deadline for applying for the exam. So I can't remember if that evidence came in before or after February first, twenty nineteen. If it's after February first, twenty nineteen, then it's not really on the exam. If it's before February 1st, 2019, then it could be on the exam. Yeah. yeah. And okay, we'll do one more, one more sample question, but I think I'll do the, the UK PDS and BCCT are both very big studies, and I don't I, I'm just out of time. I don't think I can cover them all today. And I'm and I want and it's a nice day, and I'm sure you guys want to enjoy it too. But I'll be posting it on my website anyway for you to view. But let's do, let's do just one question together. Because the UKPDS and the DCCT, DCCT are like such pivotal trials that there has been one or two questions on it on the exam. Perfect, good job. Yes, so the UKPDS study people of type two and the DCC people study on type one. Yeah. So I think I'll end the presentation here.